Tonight, the Australian economy records the weakest growth in almost three years as households grapple with the cost of living pressures. Family violence restraining orders in the spotlight in WA. Australian TV and radio star John Blackman dies aged 76. And injury forces defending champion Novak Djokovic out of the French Open. Good evening, Pamela Medlin with ABC News. Growth in the Australian economy has spluttered to a virtual standstill as households continue to juggle higher costs of living and larger mortgage repayments. But it might have been worse if it wasn't for spending on big ticket events like Taylor Swift and the Melbourne Grand Prix. It's the recession Australia isn't having yet and the Treasurer is clinging to the hope it won't arrive. Any growth is welcome uh, in these domestic and global circumstances that we confront. Unlike the 1990s... This is a recession that Australia had to have. The record population growth is keeping Australia out of recession. But per person, we've gone backwards for five quarters in a row. The economy barely grew in the March quarter, taking GDP to 1.1% for the year. Household spending provided a lifeline, with Australians not only forking out for essentials, but also splashing some cash on travel to Asia, concerts and sporting events. That meant they saved a smaller portion of their income. Government spending was also up, but investment across the economy was down. Well, forecasting is a, is a difficult process. But... The Reserve Bank Governor, grilled at Senate estimates ahead of the data release, remains hopeful of avoiding a recession. The economy is very weak, but we've still got the labour market growing. But that didn't stop this sobering warning. If it turns out, for example, that inflation starts to go up again or it's much stickier than we think, we're not getting it down, then we won't hesitate to move and raise interest rates again. Given the bank wants to prevent job losses, ANZ economists don't think that will happen. The chances of a hike, given they are trying to uh, achieve and maintain the gains, as we heard a lot in Senate estimates today, uh, that they're unlikely to hike again. The RBA meets again later this month. Most economists believe the March quarter GDP data won't affect the board's current holding pattern, with the chances of a rate cut by the end of the year now slightly higher. Rachel Papazzoni, ABC News. Figures obtained by the ABC show about one-fifth of family violence restraining order applications were dismissed by WA courts in the first four months of this year. Among them is a Perth woman who wants to be known as Maya, who says she was repeatedly raped by her stepfather as a teenager. She obtained an FVRO in 2021 and sought to extend it, but was knocked back. I was so isolated and nobody around me cared about what I was going through. For Maya, leaving her stepfather wasn't easy. Everything will come crashing down and it's your fault to the point where you know, you're listening for his footsteps to see what kind of mood he's in. Maya says she was abused for years. She even had his child, but fled when she feared he may abuse their daughter too. First time I felt safe was at the woman's refuge. To have the VRO and to have my... to have some sort of consequences if he did cross those lines made me feel a little bit safer. During her FVRO extension hearing in January, Maya's stepfather admitted to having sex with her while she was under the age of consent. It's 18 when there's a special relationship where one person is in a position of authority over the other. Magistrate Stephen Malley accepted family violence was committed but said Maya failed to satisfy him on the balance that her stepfather is likely to commit further acts. So it's not unusual for a court to dismiss an application for an extension of a family violence restraining order if, say for example, there hasn't been any contact between the parties? The Minister for Women maintains the system works. Each and every day there are many women who seek VROs and get them. But figures obtained by the ABC reveal only about half of FVRO applications last year had resulted in a final order or a conduct agreement. And data from the first four months of this year showed a similar trend.
Does that entire process need to be looked at? Look, I'm always open to hearing stories of, uh, from women who feel that the, the system isn't working for them. Maya says police didn't have enough evidence to pursue charges when she initially reported the abuse. And while she didn't get her FARO extension, following her stepfather's admissions in court, WA police have confirmed they've reopened their investigation. Darina Zadvirna, ABC News. A 72-year-old man has appeared in the Perth Magistrates Court accused of attempting to murder a woman who police say is known to him at a house in Gooseberry Hill. Christopher John Sullivan was charged after emergency services were called to the home yesterday afternoon and found Paulette Mountford with serious stab wounds. Mr Sullivan initially appeared in court without a lawyer and said he wanted to plead guilty but, on the magistrate's advice, returned to court represented by the duty lawyer. Mr Sullivan didn't apply for bail and his case was adjourned until his next court appearance later this month. The victim's daughters say they're devastated by the attack and have thanked those who helped their mother, who remains in a critical condition in hospital. The Greens have been accused of inciting violent pro-Palestinian protests and the vandalism of politicians' offices across the country in a fiery sitting of federal parliament. The party's leader insists the Greens are supporters of peaceful protest and have done nothing of the sort, accusing the Prime Minister of trying to make the war in Gaza all about him. As Prime Minister Anthony Albanese doesn't get to spend a whole lot of time at his Sydney electorate office, and for the last six months, none of his staff have been able to get in either. Enough is enough. Yeah. Frustration and anger over the picketing and vandalism of MPs' offices by pro-Palestinian protesters. Bipartisan blame for those accused of inciting it. The time for senators and members of parliament to continue to attend and inflame tension outside these offices must end. Yeah. The offices of elected members of parliament being targeted with red paint, with vile messages. The Greens should condemn it instead of condoning it. I will not be lectured to about peace and non-violence by people who back the invasion of Gaza. The Greens leader accusing Labor and the Coalition of ignoring the horrific human cost of war. Instead Order. of talking the about the victims, the Prime right. Minister the... wants to make it about the... himself. Insisting his party members, elected or otherwise, are not to blame. The Greens, as a party of peace and non-violence, support protest that is peaceful. What happened in Parliament today was the culmination of months of frustration from Labor and the Coalition that the Greens are using debate on the war in Gaza simply to win votes here at home. But the Greens' support for the Palestinian cause has been clear long before this current chapter in the conflict began. And its argument that Australia isn't doing enough to call out Israel's offensive may well be resonating with parts of the community. Matthew Doran, ABC News, Canberra. Health insurer Medibank plans to defend allegations it breached privacy laws in the lead up to a massive data breach almost two years ago. The Information Commissioner will argue Medibank failed to take reasonable steps to protect the personal information of nearly 10 million customers. It resulted in hackers posting their names, addresses and Medicare card numbers to the dark web. With so many affected, the maximum fine could reach into the trillions of dollars. Ultimately, it will be up to the federal court to determine the appropriate penalty. Entities aren't going to be punished just for being subject to a data breach, but they are going to be the subject of investigation by our office for failure to put reasonable steps in place to prevent such a breach from happening. Australia's online safety regulator has dropped a high-profile legal case against Elon Musk's social media giant X. The eSafety Commissioner wanted the platform to take down videos of the stabbing of a Sydney priest. The federal court case was shaping as a test of the regulator's global power but has now been abandoned. Tom Lowry reports. The battle has been lost. I made a strategic decision to withdraw here. But the eSafety Commissioner warns the fight is just beginning. Let's face it, the war is going to be much longer and more extended. In the wake of the stabbing of a Sydney bishop in April, the online safety authority wanted to force X and other companies to take down graphic vision of the attack, not just here, but globally. The only way you can remove that content is at, uh, at scale is at the source. X and its billionaire owner were quick to claim the win. 
This case has raised important questions on how legal powers can be used to threaten global censorship of speech, and we're heartened to see that freedom of speech has prevailed. Freedom of speech is worth fighting for. Elon Musk took a personal interest in the case. Julian Mangrant says that carried consequences. Well, he issued a dog whistle to 181 million users around the globe, which resulted in death threats uh, directed at me. We back the eSafety Commissioner, particularly in light of the reprehensible threats to her physical safety and the threats to her family. It is an absolute disgrace that she and her family have been subjected to this uh, online abuse. This case was being closely watched as a test of a domestic authority's power to regulate a global space. Some have argued it would have been a hard one for the eSafety Commissioner to win. And others hope highlighting the regulator's lack of power might push governments into action. It may end up that the case for change will be proved by losing in court rather than by winning. Media giant News Corp wants social media platforms to have to abide by a social licence. Essentially, a new set of tougher regulations and obligations as to how they operate in Australia. It's time for them to play by our rules. Given recent experience, that might be easier said than done. Tom Lowry, ABC News, Canberra. Radio and television funny man John Blackman has been remembered for his irreverence and quick wit, but also his generosity and kindness following his death at the age of 76. Blackman became an iconic member of the Hey Hey It's Saturday cast in the 1980s and 90s, with his signature off-the-cuff jokes that reflected a humour of the different time. The voice of variety comedy, John Blackman was the king of the perfectly timed zinger and the man behind beloved characters. Do you do voices? Yeah, I can do Blackman's voice. Listen. All right. How you going? All right? Oh, that's <laughs> very good. Born in 1947, Blackman grew up in Melbourne. He worked in sales before finding his true love, radio. So I'm sort of like a comedic sniper and I didn't realise I was, able, was going to be able to put this to any sort of use. <laughs> until I actually got into radio. He honed his craft in Goulburn and Canberra before returning to Melbourne, where at Channel 9 he met Daryl Summers. Hey Hey It's Saturday was born soon after. Daryl's always been a great ad-libber, and uh, we just had this wonderful symbiosis. Oh, look, Norman Hello, Neumann hasn't got Darryl. the gear on. Hello, Norman. Hello there. I'm naked. I've just got out of the shower. <laughs> Daryl Summers remembered how Blackman would often have him in fits of laughter on the Hey Hey set. Sadly today, I'm just crying, he said in a statement. While it was Hey Hey on the weekends, Blackman also had a successful radio show on 3AW. We had some terrible fights. He once said, Hinch and I have buried the hatchet so many times, my backyard garden's getting rusty. But some of his comedy hasn't aged well. Singer Kamal has since spoken publicly about the hurt that racially charged jokes about him on Hey Hey caused. John Blackman didn't apologise. How would you like a brand new car? After Hey Hey It's Saturday wrapped, Blackman did a variety of work, including more radio and even Uber driving. Great dad, great brother. A terrific mate. He was diagnosed with cancer in 2018 and had to have a jaw reconstruction. Then he was diagnosed with bone cancer. Hopefully he'll be up there having a, a drink with Bert and, and Don. I mean, he is one of the last of the greats. If I was asked to describe myself, I look, I, if, on my tombstone, here lies John Blackman, bloody good bloke. Coming up on 7.30 with Sarah Ferguson, the gifted boxer hoping to make it big. There's a lot that goes into boxing if you want to make it to the world stage. He's just always been a naturally gifted athlete and a natural talent. Oh, big shot, big right hand from Kulwo. He's very competitive on the inside but very respectful for people and his opponents. Also, I'll speak to Treasurer Jim Chalmers about today's GDP figures. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has been returned to power in India, but the result was much tighter than many were predicting. Tonight, the PM and his ruling BJP party have been forced to meet with political allies after failing to form a majority. Modi! Modi! Claiming victory, a rock star welcome for an expected and historic win. It's only the second time an Indian Prime Minister has claimed a third term. 
We Indians will walk together towards the development of the country and in this third term, the country will write a new chapter of big decisions. But it's not the triumph Mr Modi or his party might have wanted. The ruling BJP lost seats to a stronger than expected opposition. And for the first time in a decade, it did not secure a majority on its own. The Prime Minister has lost his mandate. This is his political and moral defeat. The verdict marks a surprising revival for the opposition India alliance led by Rahul Gandhi. They've won 234 seats. That's more than 40% of the lower house. A big boost for the scion of India's fabled political dynasty. I would like to say to the people of my Uttar Pradesh that they have shown great wisdom and I am proud of them. Keeping a close eye on election coverage, this street food vendor says after a decade of Mr Modi, he'd hoped for change. Business is down. Unemployment is there. The cost of living keeps rising. What are we supposed to do? The PM is known for his strongman, decisive politics. But if his victory speech is anything to go by, Indians are likely to see a humbler Modi as he relies on his coalition partners to govern the country for the first time in a decade. It's a bittersweet victory for the BJP. Politically weakened, they're promising to do better. We did not get the mandate we expected, but we are happy with whatever the people have given us. And the people have spoken. A victory for democracy. Meghna Bali, ABC News, New Delhi. The United States President Joe Biden has issued a sweeping directive to stop most migrants seeking asylum at the US-Mexican border. The shutdown will come into effect immediately, but Republicans say it's too little too late. Facing mounting political pressure, the US president says it's time to gain control of the border. I'm moving past Republican obstruction and using the executive authorities available to me as president to do what I can on my own to address the border. Those caught crossing illegally could be quickly deported or turned back to Mexico under the measure. But the president says he's not demonizing immigrants. I'll never refer to immigrants as poisoning the blood of a country. And further, I'll never separate children from their families at the border. The asylum ban kicks in when the daily average of border arrests hits 2,500. There will be exemptions for unaccompanied children and people who face serious medical or safety threats. For those waiting at the border today, it was a bitter blow. I hope Joe Biden puts his hand on his heart and changes his mind to all migrants attempting to cross to the United States. The former president, Donald Trump, and fellow Republicans slammed the plan as insufficient. Why didn't you do this last month or the month before or the month before? How many dead bodies is enough? The truth is that Joe Biden's executive order won't stop the invasion. It's weak and it's pathetic. It will actually make the invasion worse. Immigration is high on the agenda for Americans in the run-up to the November elections. According to polls, Donald Trump is ahead on the issue of who would better handle border security. Joe Biden will be hoping today's announcement will bridge the gap. But immigration advocates are already flagging an appeal, accusing the president of backtracking on his legal obligations to protect asylum seekers. Carrington Clark, ABC News, Washington. Graphic excerpts from Hunter Biden's memoir have been used against him in his criminal trial in the US state of Delaware. The president's son has pleaded not guilty to three charges stemming from the purchase of a gun in 2018. North America correspondent Barbara Miller was in court in Wilmington. Hunter Biden arrived at court to hear his own words turned against him. The prosecution playing lengthy excerpts from the audio book of his memoir, which he narrated. I bought crack cocaine on the streets of Washington, D.C. and cooked up my own inside a hotel bungalow in Los Angeles. The First Lady, Joe Biden and other family members listened as he described his descent into addiction. I possessed a new superpower. The ability to find crack in any town at any time, no matter how unfamiliar the terrain. I could get off a plane in Timbuktu and score a bag of crack. 
The prosecution told jurors Hunter Biden knew what he was doing when he lied to purchase a gun in 2018. No one is above the law. Addiction may not be a choice, but lying and buying a gun is a choice. But the defence argued Hunter Biden did not believe he was addicted when he wrote on the paperwork that he did not have a drug problem. The defence lawyer said his client had no intent to deceive. Earlier, one juror was replaced after sending a message to the judge that she didn't have a car and couldn't afford to get to the court by any other means. It was a reminder that it really is 12 ordinary Americans deciding a case with potential implications for a presidential election. Hunter Biden's ex-wife is likely to be called soon, followed by a former lover, his brother's widow. Barbara Miller, ABC News, Wilmington, Delaware. The Royal Australian Mint has unveiled its most highly anticipated coins of recent time, featuring Australia's favourite blue healer, Bluey. The three collectible coins go on sale tomorrow. They're Australia's favourite healers, capturing the hearts of millions around the world. Now, Bluey and family have been immortalised in limited edition collector's coins, or dollar bucks. We've got a coin that's got Bluey herself on it, then we've got the healer family, and of course the third coin is one of my favourites, the grannies. Let me count my coins. One, two, oh that's a nice one. Hurry up! <laughs> These won't go into general circulation and demand is expected to be so great the Mint is encouraging people to register through an online ballot. The dollar bucks will be available for sale as individual coin cards or in a three-coin set with a sticker sheet and just 30,000 of each have been minted. Interestingly, there are a few little sort of Easter eggs through the program as well. There's a, uh, a long dog in, uh, in each of the coins as well that people can be looking for. May I help you with those coins? The dollar bucks will be released for sale tomorrow morning. Bluey! Isaac Naruzzi, ABC News, Canberra. To finance now and markets were largely unaffected by today's slightly than weaker expected GDP number. Here's Alan Kohler. Well, Australia's economic growth has basically ground to a halt, which was no surprise to anyone. The only question was how close to zero it would be. The answer is as close as possible without being zero. 0.1% between December quarter and March quarter. Now, here's a longer-term perspective. 60 years of the annual growth rate. Now, I've drawn that dashed red line to show that while growth has been volatile, ranging from minus 3 to plus 9% in non-pandemic times, the 60-year trend has been steadily downwards. And it's worse when gross domestic product is divided by population to get per capita growth. Reserve Bank Governor Michelle Bullock says this isn't very useful considering we have low unemployment, but I beg to differ. It usefully shows how growth is being propped up by immigration. Per capita GDP fell in the March quarter for the fifth consecutive quarter. Final graph from the national accounts. The saving rate used to be about 5%, but after the fiscal largesse of the pandemic was spent, it now seems to be stuck at 1%, which is another symptom of the cost of living crisis. The dollar had a twitch upwards when the GDP came out, but is now slightly lower at 66.6 .6 US cents. The share market also twitched, but stayed there, closing 0.4% higher with banks and retailers up, miners down. The Indian share market recovered 2% of yesterday's 5.7% loss following the surprising election result there. Other markets were mixed after a small rise in New York. And finally, oil, copper and gold went up last night, while iron ore fell again. And that's finance. Yannick Sinner will become the first world number one from Italy after Novak Djokovic pulled out of the French Open with a knee injury. Djokovic had qualified for the quarterfinals but won't take to the court and his title defence is over. This looks a bit more concerning. Novak Djokovic had a medical timeout early in his fourth round win over Argentina's Francisca Sarundolo. Last night, the 37-year-old withdrew from the tournament 
saying, I played with my heart and gave my all in yesterday's match and unfortunately, due to a medial meniscus tear in my right knee, my team and I had to make a tough decision after careful consideration and consultation. That decision will see him lose the number one ranking. You win champion Yannick Sinner will officially take the top spot on Monday. It's everyone's player's dream to become number one in the world. In the other way, seeing Novak retiring, it's uh, for everyone disappointing. Um, so I wish him a speedy recovery. Australia's Alex Dimonor will be playing for a place in the semi-finals when he meets German Alexander Zverev. It's not just myself, I think it's just the whole whole country is is showing what we can do. West Coast mid-season draftee Jack Hutchinson will make his AFL debut against North Melbourne at Perth Stadium on Saturday. The 22-year-old forward was selected by the Eagles with pick three last week and booted five goals in their WAFL win over Perth on Sunday. The forward had been playing country football in Victoria before heading to Collingwood's VFL program in 2024. Now to the weather with Tabarak al and We've got quite a bit of rain on the way, Tabarak. We certainly do, Pamela, so I hope you've got all your washing done today because we've got a pretty wet run from tomorrow, but I'll have more on that in just a minute. Today, Perth reached a top of 23.8 degrees around a quarter past two this afternoon after a mild low of 16 just before half past four this morning. And much of the south recorded similar overnight minimums in the low to mid-teens, while Southern Cross Airport dropped to four degrees, the cold in the state. Up north it was a beautiful clear day but not as warm as usual. Instead maximum temperatures stayed under 30 degrees. In fact Kalambaru was the warmest spot today reaching 29.7 degrees. And on the satellite, the state is looking mostly cloud free. We did have some areas of low cloud over the lower and southwest, which produced some light falls from Bunbury to Augusta today. But we can expect to see that heavy retain rain return to much of the southwest as our next cold front comes through tomorrow. The front is forecast to start arriving around the southwest capes in the morning, making its way through to the metro area around school pickup time. And it will start weakening as it moves inland on Friday before a stronger system moves through on the weekend. Taking a look around the country tomorrow and it's looking pretty chilly for much of the southeast. Sydney and Adelaide getting to 18 degrees, partly cloudy and 17 in Melbourne, Hobart and Canberra only aiming for a top of 15, while Brisbane and Darwin will see sunny conditions. Back to WA's north and more clear blue skies on the way. Temperatures staying about the same in the mid to high 20s, while overnight lows are dipping slightly down to 6 degrees at Newman. For central parts, tomorrow starting off with some sunny conditions before that wet weather makes its way up. We've got showers and the chance of thunderstorms south of Durian Bay all the way to Bremer Bay with possible heavy falls as well. Now much of the southwest could see up to 30 millimetres of rain and the showers will also be extending eastwards to reach a line from Calbarry to Esperance by the evening. For Perth, it'll be bucketing down again with more rain and possibly severe thunderstorms forecast. So we could see up to 35 mils of rain. The city will get down to 12 degrees overnight before reaching a top of 24. And that stormy weather also means damaging winds are possible. So there is a gale warning for the Lewin coast and a strong wind warning for several coasts extending from Geraldton to Esperance. That includes Perth local waters where winds will be northerly increasing to 30 knots before shifting southwesterly in the evening. The sun will rise at 11 minutes past 7 setting at 5.19 p.m. And then looking ahead, it's a bit of rinse and repeat. We've got constant showers and cooler temperatures all the way through until a bit about mid next week. So definitely looking like winter, Pamela. <laughs> it's very wintry. Thanks for that, Tabarak. That's ABC News for now. We'll be back with you tomorrow. In the meantime, you can stay up to date with ABC News Online or catch the news anytime on ABC iView. Stay with us for 730